Hey folks, Rich here at RC Informer. Thanks for stopping by and uh, checking out this video on the uh, Air Epic HSD, HSD Super Viper uh, from Banana Hobby. Um, this is going to be uh, kind of like a build review setup guide. Uh, it's going to be a little less of a, of a building video really because there's really not much to build on this airplane. Right out of the box, 16 screws and this whole thing goes together. So um, not much to it as far as that goes. Four screws really will get the whole nose section on. Four screws get your wing four screws get your horizontal stabilizers and elevators on and four screws for your rudder. You put your receiver bat and battery in and go and you fly this thing. But what I'm going to show you guys in this video is how to set it up and a couple of small improvements, things I found that made it uh, fly a whole lot better. Um, uh, there's an elevator to throttle mixer. I'm going to show you how you actually set that up and how you make your connections. Uh, I'm also going to show you uh, the landing gear reset button that if you don't know it's there, it can get you because uh, when the gear, if the gear gets an over voltage, uh, you have to reset them and, and I'll show you that. Also, after I filmed the initial promo video, uh, I actually found a way to improve the stabilizer by putting a much better spar in there and, uh, and it makes the plane, really makes a big difference and makes it fly rock solid. I'm also going to show you some throws and uh, some adjustments to the tail that really make this plane fly so much better than, than it comes stock out of the box. Anyway guys, without further delay, let's get on to the, uh, the, the review, build, and setup guide of the uh, Air Epic HSD Super Viper from Banana Hobby. The primary focus of this video is really going to be on the uh, inside of the plane and how you set this up, but I will show you guys a few more things. Uh, with it. Um, uh, again, uh, this airplane actually comes in two parts, the forward half of the fuselage and the uh, back half of the fuselage. You can see uh, where it connects right here. Four screws get the whole front on and this actually can be removed for transport if you want to. One thing I added is I did put some washers uh, under my screw heads here. It's not really necessary but I felt that would make it just a little bit more secure. You can see all your nose wires here uh, they run uh, into this section and then they go back and they all plug into the uh, mixing board back there uh, uh, and, the, and or the, uh, the receiver wherever they, uh, they need to go. Um, uh, if, you, if you decide you want to take the fuselage apart for transport, uh, it's not a bad idea to get all your connectors kind of lined up right around where this bulkhead is um, so you can disconnect it. Now I went ahead and left mine on and I actually used some of this uh, uh, sort of fiber tape here just to tape all the wires in place because I'm just going to leave my nose on and so forth. Another option is you could even glue the nose on if you really wanted to but uh, uh, but it really is kind of a nice setup. Your uh, retract wire, um, your um, uh, nose wheel steering and door uh, uh, wires all go through here again and they run all the way back and you want to probably pick uh, one side to sort of run everything on. It just kind of makes it nice and neat. You can see my battery wires. I actually used a little bit of Velcro to wrap them all around just so they're not flopping around. It's always a good idea. Uh, this is, uh, I believe it's 10 gauge wire, so it's a pretty thick wire. You want to kind of keep it opposite side of the receiver, uh, as you can see there. Um, but uh, as you can see, my batteries are all secure in there, two four cell packs. Uh, what I usually do, if you guys see my videos, is I'll run some double-sided scotch tape on the bottom uh, of the, uh, the, 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 the battery compartment floor and then I'll put this shelf liner stuff on there and that way you can adjust your battery's position wherever you need it to be to get the CG uh, where you want it and these straps uh, you can slide back and forth because there's uh, uh, quite a, 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 tr a, a sort of a slot down there that you can slide these things and uh, you can use Velcro to secure your batteries but I found the shelf liner stuff works really well uh, the straps that came with the airplane were too short so I actually used these uh, Velcro one wraps uh, that you get over at uh, Lowe's and Home Depot and uh, those seem to be really the best ones to use especially for such a, a heavy set of, uh, of batteries. When it comes to connecting your batteries there's about 10 different ways that you can uh, wire this thing. Ultimately the best way would be to have a single 8 cell pack and then all you would have would be a, a black and a red that you would actually connect to, to the airplane but since a lot of us are going to have 4 cell packs uh, wired in series uh, I had to come up with uh, something else uh, to, to use to, to get them to wire in series. Now, I'm going to throw a quick picture up here of the original wire harness that I actually made for this plane. And I actually used it uh, in the plane for probably about 12 or 15 flights and it worked really well. Um, but the problem I ran into with it was is um, by having T-style connectors that came actually on the batteries, um, those really couldn't handle the high amp draw and I actually had one melt away and I'll show you a picture of that up here as well. Uh, and it melted while I was uh, while I was flying the plane, and actually did cause 
cause me to have a crash. But uh, but that's kind of my job, guys. I test fly this stuff and show you what works and what doesn't. Occasionally we find something that, that doesn't work and uh, and uh, the result is, is I can show you guys how to really wire this up uh, correctly and to make it much better. Uh, moral of the story is, is um, uh, anytime you hook connectors up in, in any way on an airplane, always use the same connector throughout the entire system. Uh, if you're going to use uh, uh, T-style connectors, use them throughout the entire airplane. If you're going to use an AN150 connector like this, um, use it throughout the entire airplane. Because anytime you, you have a connector or a, uh, um, some kind of harness with different connectors, the weaker connector is where all the heat is going to go. And then that can ultimately cause something uh, to melt and, and break down. So anyway, here's the new style, guys. Here's what I came up with. If you have two batteries, how to really join this up together. Um, uh, you can see here uh, I have a, a double male end here to act as my uh, series connector. Uh, the beauty about these AN150s that I'm going to show you guys again is the nice thing is, is you can unscrew these things. You can inspect uh, uh, your solder joint and how good of a job you did to it. And then they're actually also real easy uh, to, uh, to re-solder and reuse actually the connectors, guys, because um, again, this thing all just kind of uh, screws, uh, screws in uh, nicely. Uh, but anyway, essentially, uh, this is what I came up with, guys. AN150 uh, connectors all the way around. Probably XT150 connectors will be just as good. Um, uh, but uh, uh, you do have to be careful that you don't put these in any kind of reverse polarity. And you can see how I'm putting red to red and I'm putting black to black. And uh, this will keep uh, these batteries uh, wired together nicely in the airplane. The next thing you're going to connect really here, guys, is your, uh, your, uh, your black wire. And then your final connection here is going to be uh, uh, your red wire uh, to the insulated bullet. It's also important to note that uh, as you watch uh, this, the rest of this video, you'll see uh, the uh, older style connector uh, that I used uh, in this video. Rather than reshooting the entire thing, I just kind of left some of that in there. But uh, just keep in mind that uh, this is really, I think, probably the best way to wire this using these nice big, you know, AN150 uh, connectors uh, throughout this uh, this entire plane. Uh, they just have such a good connector, and of course, um, uh, the spark arrestor feature uh, is really nice. Now, one other thing to note too, when you take this uh, these batteries and you store these somewhere. These are a little bigger than the connectors that we're used to using and you can see they are, they are seven millimeter bullets and actually you can actually touch the metal here with your finger so you want to be careful where you put these things so you don't accidentally have something stick in there and actually connect or contact the two of these causing sparks, fires, that kind of thing. So what I came up with is a local surplus place has all kinds of these little plastic end caps and um, so to store these uh, batteries with these kind of connectors on there, if you get yourself some kind of tight-fitting end cap, Lowe's, Home Depot, they usually have a selection of uh, caps and things like that. Um, it's not a bad idea to get a rubber cap of some kind uh, to store your, uh, your batteries with AN150 connectors just so they don't cause a short. You can see how this setup uh, fits in the airplane uh, real nicely. Uh, you can see the, uh, the series connector here, uh, one attached to the black, one attached to the, uh, the red. And you can see how nicely it all just kind of fits down in there. Of course, you do want to make your black connection first, uh, as we just talked about. And then uh, finally, uh, your, your positive uh, wire. Uh, and again, I'm going to kind of unscrew this for you a second time, uh, just so you can see this. I showed this in the flight demo video. Uh, but you can see how nice this uh, AN150 uh, spark arrestor uh, uh, end is. Um, it has this little piece of insulation right here. So, when you do make your final contact, uh, the first uh, thing that touches is, uh, is, the, is the, uh, the tip here. And what there is, is there's sort of a built-in capacitor in here that discharges any potential spark. So uh, it's really nice that you get no spark out of this thing uh, when you connect it. And, uh, and you can also, again, just like I indicated before, you can inspect the solder job that was done with this thing at the factory or even um, the, the solder job that, uh, that, that you do yourself on it. And uh, it's great because you can easily desolder these things and, uh, and re-solder and just really reuse the, uh, the connectors on this. Now, I got my radio already plugged in, so I'll show you what the final connection looks like on this. Uh, just like I showed you in the flight demo video, you see how nicely this thing goes together? absolutely no spark whatsoever and it's got a real nice seven millimeter uh, connection so definitely a, a superior way to, to connect uh, these batteries guys with all these uh, these AN150s. Um, one more thing to just note uh, just sort of to reiterate notice my power wires run along one side of the fuselage 
uh, it's really a, a good idea to do that, um, uh, to have them on one side and have your receiver here on the other side. You can see my antennas right here, one tape to the wall, um, uh, sort of longitudinally, and one going up and down so they're 90 degrees to each other to, you know, help minimize um, any kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, loss of signal. But you definitely want to have um, your, um, your, um, your uh, radio or your, your uh, receiver uh, antennas on one side of the airplane, power wires on the other side of the plane. Just keep them apart from each other to minimize uh, that chance of uh, any signal loss. When it comes to setting up the airplane initially, you have uh, these three wires as I just talked about. Um, the, uh, the retract, the nose wheel steering, and the uh, nose gear door. Those run all the way along the side. You can go either side if you want to, but I, I chose the, uh, the left side of the airplane. And uh, they're going to plug in here. And where they're going to go into is, you can see right there where it says door. That's where the gear door servo is going to go. Um, you can see the, the pins there that actually are not connected to anything that you can see right down in there where it says rudder, R-U-D. That's where you normally would plug in your nose wheel steering. Um, uh, but I ended up going with mine directly into the receiver, which is an option, okay? Uh, and then you can set that up uh, uh, with a trimmable uh, nose wheel uh, steering knob. Um, uh, you have to have a seventh or an eighth channel to do that with, but I chose to do it that way. So basically, instead of having the nose gear steering, nose wheel steering, and the rudder Y harness together, uh, I have a separate trim for it. Now, I have a video on that. You can check that out on rcinformer.com, uh, how to separate your nose wheel steering and have it trim and all that. Um, but essentially, that's where your rudder goes. If you only have a six-channel radio, um, that's where your nose wheel steering uh, goes, right into where those three pins you see are bare. And then the last connection uh, is going to go right here into the landing gear controller uh, board. Now, you can see on the, uh, the left here, uh, you can see that the, uh, the mains are already plugged in right there but the nose wheel one is in here. Uh, now the nose wheel retract, uh, the white is actually not used. It's only really a positive uh, and a negative. And uh, just to sort of uh, clarify what that, uh, that looks like, I'm gonna show you the board here. Uh, this is sort of the diagram of it. And uh, you can see right here that uh, this is uh, where those three retracts uh, uh, units go into, is these three pins right here. And then here's kind of how I highlighted it right here, what it really looks like. Um, uh, these two that you see right here, the plus and the minus, are already connected, and that's where your nose section retract uh, uh, comes in and it plugs right in there. Even though it has a, a, a black for negative, a red for positive, and a white for ground, the white really is not used, but you do plug it in that way right next to the other two, just black and red, that are already there. Now, the orientation of it, as you can see right here, is actually this way. And uh, just to sort of clarify it, uh, you can kind of see the direction in which that board is mounted. It's oriented just like this, as you can see, uh, inside the airplane way back there. Now, it's kind of hard to get to, uh, but all you need to do, again, is just plug in that uh, nose section retract uh, right in there. Now, the other thing I want to mention is the retract button. There's a reset button right here. And in order to get to that thing, uh, you just have to sort of put your finger sort of around the wires here, and then you'll feel the button kind of right back uh, in here, and it's kind of where that, uh, that, that light is. It's actually right next to uh, that light, that little blue light that you see down in there. And uh, what that's for is, is uh, sometimes the retracts can um, freeze, and, and they'll do that in case they get overloaded or something. So your retracts will just stop working. It's sort of a protection feature. So what you have to do is, um, in fact, you can kind of see it right there, just below uh, that blue light, there's a little black button in there. And you can see it right there. You can reach around, feel it real easy, and you basically you press that button, hold it, press it a few times, and what it'll do is it'll just reset the landing gear. And uh, then your landing gear will start working again. So if your gear stops working, just hit that reset button and get it working again on the ground, and you should be good to go. Now, just to give you guys a, a much better view of that reset button, you can see I cleared away some of the wires. And uh, right next, next to the, uh, the, the bright blue light, you can see the black button right there. Um, and to get to that, really the easiest thing to do is just to put your finger uh, really around the back side. And you can see I can reach it that way easy. And as I back my hand out, you can see how, how I'm getting in there. Rather than clearing away the wires, if you do need to reach that button, uh, just stick your hand, like I said, your finger. I actually push with my fingernail. 
Uh, mo this bundle comes, oh, I added a few tie wraps to it, but it mostly comes bundled from the factory like that, so I didn't see any real reason to take it apart since you can go around the back side, like I said, to get to that button. You do want to check all your connections, just make sure everything is good in there, but from the factory they do a pretty good job getting this thing all together, and really all you get from the factory is all, everything's all connected, but these um, uh, uh, six wires up front here that plug right into your receiver, so uh, it's really, really simple uh, to set this up uh, from the factory just with those six wires that you see right there going right into your receiver, and then those three wires that we just talked about, two plugging into the, uh, the main mixer board, and then one plugging into the retract uh, board, and, uh, and, and, and you're good to go. Now, a quick look at those connections here, guys. I went ahead and I labeled everything here. Just like we talked about a second ago to review, you see where the nose gear door plugs right in there. You can see where your nose wheel steering goes into the rudder. And the, the one that's next to it is actually already plugged into your rudder channel. So that's how they're essentially Y harnessed together. And uh, you can see here the, uh, the six wires that you easily just plug into your receiver, aileron, elevator, throttle, rudder, flap, and gear. So six channels is all you need uh, to fly this airplane. Uh, if you want to go with a sixth or even a, or if you want to go with a um, if you want to go with a seventh or an eighth channel, okay, uh, your seventh channel would actually be reverse thrust. And what I used for my seventh channel, you can see off the ESC wire, there's actually a yellow wire. This is a lot like the uh, HSD uh, or Taft J10, same wiring mechanism, but there's just a single yellow wire that comes off of that and you plug that into the channel that you want that to go into. Um, now, in, in this case, I, uh, I plugged it into, uh, I think it's the, uh, the eighth channel is where I put that, and uh, I assigned that to a switch. So, really, you just plug that single um, orange wire, actually, that comes off of there. You see that orange wire here, and you can see right here where it goes right into the receiver, and, and that lets you uh, 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 have reverse thrust assigned to really any switch, and that when you hit that switch, you'll uh, basically just reverse the polarity on your fan and uh, your fan will spin backwards uh, uh, for reverse. So anyway, just to sort of sum it up guys, it's a six channel airplane. Again, aileron, elevator, throttle, rudder, rudder flap, and gear. Um, if you want to separate your nose gear steering from this main control board, don't plug it into the board, plug it right into your receiver. That's your seventh channel. If you want reverse, uh, you can take that uh, uh, orange wire, uh, plug it into an open channel and, uh, and uh, assign a switch to it and you have reverse. So again, you have a lot of options with this plane, but essentially all you need is six channels to fly it. For those of you that want to set up the reverse uh, thrust uh, on the airplane via the uh, little uh, orange wire that plugs into any open channel, uh, again, the seventh or eighth channel that you might have on your, uh, your radio, um, you need to have a programming card. Now I'm using this Turnigy programming card. There's uh, a million different clones of this thing, uh, different brands that produce the same thing. And essentially, all you do is you hook your BEC wire, okay, that you normally plug in your receiver right into here. And uh, you power up your airplane and give it a minute, give, wait a second, and then this whole board will light up and it will show you the proper settings uh, that you have. Uh, uh, and, and then you can go ahead and make changes with your up, down, right, and left key, and you press OK to actually program the thing. So um, uh, here's a quick uh, picture that I took of mine when I programmed it, and you can see all the red lights and everything that's, uh, that's highlighted here. And uh, just follow the instructions here, and uh, simply uh, all it says is, is you basically put your brake on, which you can see the, uh, the appropriate red light here uh, is lit up on mine, and uh, put your governor mode on also. Uh, and then you press your, your OK button and that will program everything. And you can see again the, the graphic here or the, uh, the photo I took when I programmed mine and how you want it illuminated. That will allow your reverse thrust to work via any switch, and you can just program that uh, via your radio. The last thing that they do mention here uh, is to actually put your timing on high. Because this is an 8-cell uh, airplane with a lower KV than the 6-cell version, you want to um, set your timing to high to get the appropriate power out of the airplane. So if you're not getting the power that you need out of the airplane, uh, it may very well be because uh, you just don't have the timing set to high. So that's why they have this for the 8-cell version only. You wouldn't want to do that on the 6-cell version because you'll probably uh, over-amp the thing. But essentially, that's all you need to do. Set your brake on and your governor on uh, for, reverse, uh, uh, for reverse thrust. And uh, set your timing on high for the 8-cell version so you get the appropriate power. The last item I want to show you inside here is the uh, elevator uh, compensator. And it mixes in with the uh, throttle. 
you can see there the flashing light that you use as an, uh, as an indicator. And you can see right here uh, the little button here. Um, and you see when you press that button, the light will flash. And each time you press that button, okay, you get different flashes. There it flashed twice. There it flashed a third time. There it flashed four times. And there it flashed five times. When you press it again, it goes back to just one flash. Now what you're doing there is you're setting the amount of elevator pitch up uh, for when you advance the throttle. Now uh, just to show you here in the text of this thing, you can see here where they show the mix control adjustment button, which is H that we just looked at right there on the PC board. And uh, again, there's levels one through five and it mixes the, uh, the proportion of, uh, of uh, elevator mix to how much throttle that you're using. Now, when you press the button more, the first time, or it's flat, or flat, and it flashes just once, you have four percent compensation. When you press it again and it flashes twice, like we saw, it's six percent. Three times eight percent, four times ten percent, and five times twelve percent. When you press it again, it goes all the way back to one again, which is just four percent. And what that's going to do is that's going to adjust the amount of elevator travel that you have when you advance your throttle. Now this is going to be sort of personal flying style and how you, you like to set this thing. Uh, they do say you want to start at level 3, okay, which is actually uh, just 8%. Fly the airplane, see how you like it. I found that uh, 2 and 3 seem to be a good place for it. Uh, the more you fly, you'll probably get uh, um, um, more used to how you like that, uh, that set. Um, but one thing you do want to be careful of is if you do get in here, you point in here with anything, Use something plastic, okay, when you're going in here to push something, or use your finger, um, because the last thing you want to do is put something metal in there and end up shorting something out. The other thing you want to do is be real careful of these six wires. These go into your aileron, elevator, rudder, throttle, flaps, and gear. Um, you don't want to move those wires very much, because they're just, you can see, they're just sire, soldered onto a PC board. The more you bend these and flex these, the more you're going to fatigue those solder joints, and they can break off. So. It's a real good idea that once you get your, um, uh, to be careful when you plug these wires into your receiver, uh, and, and be careful not to fiddle with these things too much. Leave those wires alone as much as you can. Don't push your battery up against them and all kinds of things, because again, you want those solder joints to stay, to stay, uh, stay in place, and, uh, and again, just not disturb those wires, or disturb them as little as you possibly can. Now to show you how this pitch compensator works, I went ahead and I pressed that button to put this on the fifth level, which, uh, as we know right here, guys, is 12% uh, is uh, uh, on the fifth setting. So that'll give you the most elevator uh, compensation mix. Now, what I did is I removed also <laughs> my three motor wires just to sort of demonstrate this so I don't get any real motor movement. But uh, you can see here that uh, as, I, as I advance uh, my throttle, okay, on my stick, you can see that elevator moving up. Okay, and that's the compensation that you get. The plane, you know, probably has an inherent uh, pitch up tendency of some kind, and, uh, or pitch down tendency, I should say. And as you advance the throttle, that elevator comes up. And that's the, uh, the highest setting right there, guys, the 12%. Uh, so when you set it on three or two, it's gonna be a little less than that. So you have to fly the plane, see how it is with your, uh, your, uh, your personal preference and see how you like it and adjust it accordingly, but they do say to start uh, on, the, uh, on the third setting. And like I said, I've used two and three and it's worked out pretty good for me. Now what I went ahead and did is I put the elevator compensator on the third level, which is their recommended uh, position. Just to show you what this looks like, as I advance the throttle, the elevator goes up. As I decrease it, it goes down. So that's what the third setting looks like. Again, start off with the third and see if you like it. As you advance the throttle when you're flying the airplane, um, if the plane is pitching up too much, then you want to go down to level two or down to level one. It all depends on how your airplane is flying. If you're advancing the throttle and, 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 and decreasing the throttle as you're flying the plane and the airplane is not pitching up or down, that's pretty much uh, the, uh, the desired condition you're looking for. So set it on three, try it out, and then adjust accordingly. One last note I want to make about the uh, battery compartment. Uh, for those of you that uh, want extra flight time and don't mind the extra weight, you can go with almost any size battery in this thing. Uh, I'm running the 5000 uh, Genesis packs in here, but you can run 6000 or probably even more. I haven't actually had a bigger battery than the 5000s in here, but 
the plane floats right in. Uh, I don't think the extra weight is going to affect it much, maybe in the vertical performance, but, um, but you can see how much space is in here. You can put huge batteries in here if you want to. One last item I would suggest to do inside your, uh, your receiver area here is to secure your BEC. Uh, you see I have it on the back wall, just sort of Velcroed there. Uh, when, when all this bundle came from the factory, the way you see it, it was just kind of sitting in here. And it was just sort of flapping around, uh, flopping around. You probably just don't want it there. So secure it somewhere. It doesn't have to be there on that back wall, but uh, really anywhere you secure it, it's probably a real good idea to do rather than just uh, letting it kind of hang there. Just a few things I want to note about the uh, landing gear and in particular the nose wheel uh, section of the plane. Really all three wheels, uh, it's really a good idea to use some oil on these things. Um, they're not ball bearing supported, but they are aluminum hubs on a, on a steel shaft. And those can wear out fast unless there is some uh, lubricant on there. You can see my plane's all dirty because I've been flying it around. Also, any E-rings, E-clips that you might have on here, it's a real good idea to put some contact cement on the, them uh, just to keep those clips uh, in place. Uh, this is probably some of the sweetest uh, landing gear I think I've ever seen. It just has really nice uh, compression and everything. Uh, another couple of uh, notes that I do want to make. Um, one thing here regarding the, uh, the gear uh, centering mechanism, um, it was in kind of an oddball place and what I ended up doing was is I ended up putting a second screw right here and, uh, and screwing it in place and I also drilled a hole as I'll throw this picture up here you'll see what I did with it. I drilled a hole in this plate so the main gear screw actually could go in there too and it just keeps it a lot more secure. Uh, in place than from uh, where it was uh, before. Now, one item I do want to point out is what, what happened was I noticed there was a whole ton of play in the steering mechanism here. And uh, this is not much at all, but there was a lot more before. And what I found out that was actually causing that uh, was the E-ring here on the forward side, which I'm going to show you here, or on the back side here. All the way down in here, there's a little teeny tiny E-ring right down in here and it was moving back and forth quite a bit. And what I did was is I put a plastic washer behind it and that got rid of a ton of the play. Otherwise that thing was going forward and back and just making a ton of steering play. So it's not a bad idea to check yours out and if you have too much play, see what it is in this whole mechanism that's moving. And in my case it was this spot and it just needed a, um, a, a washer back there, a really tiny plastic washer to get the slop out of it. You can see here a much cl more close-up picture of uh, what I was referring to. Um, you can see that uh, that E-ring right there. Uh, again, it had tons of play because it was moving forward and back. It's kind of hard to see, but I did put a nylon washer back there behind it, uh, uh, behind the E-ring, and then I reinstalled the E-ring. It was really, really tiny, uh, uh, and it was kind of hard to do in there. It's a little bit of surgery. Uh, but once you do that, put a little bit of contact cement on that E-ring, it'll keep it in place. And again, you'll have a much tighter steering mechanism uh, just from, uh, from uh, getting the slop out of that. Here's an improvement I made to my airplane, guys, that is uh, not necessary to do, but I did find that it actually makes the airplane, the tail, a little more stable. Um, the main wing has a really nice aluminum spar running through it, but the tail I found was kind of lacking in spar a little bit, and you can see how this flexes a little bit. Now, the plane flies fine without it. I did the original flight demo video with the tail stock, okay, and didn't change anything. Um, but uh, there's only a little bit of aluminum spar that sticks out into the wing, about an inch worth or so, inch and a half or inch and a quarter. And I decided to run another spar through here. And uh, the following video, I'm going to show you what it looks like with the spar in it. You can see here what it looks like without. And you can see it has uh, a little bit of flex to it here. And then uh, this next frame, I'm going to show you what it looks like with the spar and then uh, how to go ahead and uh, and add one to it. You can see here with the uh, spar installed, you can see that this thing actually hardly flexes at all. It's, uh, it's very rigid now, it almost hardly even moves, and it makes really a tremendous difference in the strength of the tail and actually how well it flies. Now I'm going to show you real quick how to put this thing in there and what uh, size spar you need to put in here. You can see here what the installed spar looks like sticking out of here. Um, uh, you can see the red factory spar. It only goes out, sticks out like I said, one and a, about one and a quarter inches. And you can see here I added uh, another spar that goes 100 and I think it's 109 millimeters. Each plane is going to be a little bit different, but this spar passes all the way through into the other half of the elevator. Now the reason I put it so far back here like this is because there really wasn't any other place to put it. It kept running into the servo tray 
and there is a spar that exists inside right along here and um, and so the only place to put it was actually right back here and and, and it extends about halfway which is just fine uh, because there is overlap here between this spar and this spar right here and it makes it uh, really really rigid now to do this you'll need a couple things you'll need a carbon tube I used a 0 0.230 by 0.144 from gravesrc.com and uh, I rounded the uh, edges as it as you can probably see right here uh, and uh, also I used a uh, just a piece of, uh, of um, uh, uh, brass tubing where I cut the inside edge so it's going to act as a blade same thing on the other side uh, I cut this from the outside and made it sort of like a blade because this is actually what I'm going to use as a cut. I used as a cutting tool uh, to actually cut uh, down into the elevator and channel out uh, actually the uh, the uh, the foam. And you can kind of see the shadow as it kind of goes through there. Um, and then the other thing you need is sort of a long sort of drill bit. You might be able to get away without this, but I found that this was uh, really helpful. Uh, you don't have to use the exact size carbon tube as this. Um, uh, but uh, but this size, size, size seemed to fit in there uh, pretty decently. And the following steps, I'm going to show you how you actually put this thing in there. As you can see here, the first thing I had to do was really locate uh, where this, uh, this spar was going to go through, where it was going to exit. And I found this to be a really good spot for it. You just want to measure halfway here, right in the middle, and, uh, and drill a hole really in both sides here. Uh, and you're going to make it big enough so whatever carbon spar you're using will actually fit uh, pretty tightly in there. And uh, what you're going to do is uh, using uh, the drill or, or uh, you're going to drill the hole of the plastic. Then you're just going to go through foam and you're going to go uh, into the, the center. And then you're going to make the same hole on the other side. And you're going to have that one come through. And actually they're going to meet in the middle. And I'll show you what that looks like on the inside. You can see here with your first hole cut, you drill it straight through and your second hole cut right here, and you go into the center. And you'll see they'll, they'll generally meet here uh, in the middle. It's real important that you uh, drill your hole right here in the, ex in the dead center of this thing. Uh, you measure the thickness and then drill the hole right in the center in the exact same spot here as you drilled it here. Now it doesn't have to be perfect, but it does need to be pretty darn close. And then once you do that, you'll be able to run a spar, as you can see, all the way through this thing. The next thing you're going to do is remove the spar that you already have in here. And one thing you can note too is that it's it's parallel to the to the to the uh, to the spar to the little spar that actually came with the airplane for the elevator. You want to make sure it's parallel both horizontally and as you look at it uh, from the top. You just go ahead and remove this thing. Then the next thing you're going to do is take your uh, your drill bit, and you're actually going to stick your drill bit in there and go all the way through with it. And this is how you're going to actually jig this thing, basically, and just make sure that this thing is straight. Um, then you're going to go ahead and sort of take your elevator and sort of put it in place. It doesn't have to be uh, perfect. Uh, and you don't have to screw it all the way in, but with your, with your drill all the way through there, I'm going to kind of um, zoom in on this thing. You can see where that uh, drill is coming out. You're going to go ahead and, and, and push this thing on as far as you can get it. It doesn't have to be all the way. But now what you can do is you can turn your drill bit, okay? And as you turn the, uh, the drill bit, um, you're going to actually have the hole perfectly lined up here. And by the time you're done drilling through there, or at least making a mark, then you can go ahead and take this thing out of here. And, uh, and you can see here that uh, once you get it out of here, you're going to have a nice alignment hole uh, right in there. And all these holes will match up. That's how you get these holes to, to line up perfectly, is to drill it while this thing is installed. The next thing you want to do is remove your drill bit okay, from the airplane. Then you're going to go ahead and take your uh, your your cutting tool, uh, or which is basically just a, a brass tubing with a with a sharp end on it. And you can see again how I cut that on the inside on one side, and uh, cut it on the outside of the other side. I, I found that the one that I cut on the inside edge that I use as a cutter uh, seems to really uh, work best. And what you're going to do is you're going to actually put that through the other side. You can see here how I'm feeding it through, and it just kind of runs through here. Um, and then what we're going to do is just sort of like what we did before. But instead of drilling the plastic hole, the hole in the plastic, we're now going to be drilling the hole uh, in the foam. So what we do is we put this thing in here, make sure this thing's lined up, and we're going to twist this brass tube as we drill our hole all the way down into the foam. Uh, and then when you're done, you sort of pull this out. Uh, and you can finish it up if you need to. You can still put this back in here. And basically your brass tubing just works as, uh, as sort of a, a cutting tool. And uh, what's going to happen is, is 
it's going to go in far enough, and I'm going to put my finger here, that's about as far as it goes, because what it does is it actually runs into right here at the tip where the, this spar, you can see this enters an internal spar that runs through here. And, uh, and actually the spar, the new spar that you're putting in there, uh, runs in and it actually stops right about here. And that's what you want, it actually forms sort of like a triangle here with one, the main spar running this way and this spar running right into it. So you're going to have spar overlap right here, which is going to make this thing uh, nice and strong. Next, you're going to test fit your uh, carbon spar. And, uh, and the good news is, is um, you don't have to have an exact size uh, brass tube to do this. My brass tube is actually a lot smaller, um, uh, a lot thinner diameter actually than my carbon spar. And I want that because I want the foam to actually have a nice tight uh, fit around this thing. And what you're going to do is you're going to round the edges of the uh, carbon tube and you're going to find that this thing is going to really easily just plug right into this thing. And again, it's going to go about halfway. If you want to know how far it's going, just push it as far as it'll go. You don't want to damage the internal spar with the brass drill that you made, so you don't want to turn it too tight in there. Uh, but once it stops, you can kind of pull it out with your thumb marking it, and you can get an idea of where actually it stops. And again, it stops about halfway, which gives you a good spar overlap. Finally, you can really make your, uh, your final installation of the uh, first side that you did. And uh, really all you need to do is just sort of uh, insert the, both spars in here. And again, this is going to go all the way in here. Your, your small red spar that uh, actually came on the plane is already in there. Um, and then you can make your, your connection here, your aileron connection, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, your uh, elevator connection in there. And then just push the whole thing kind of in there. Very carefully, you sort of feed the whole thing uh, together. And you can see how nicely that goes in here. Then you push your spar in as far as it will go. Uh, and you'll have a nice uh, rigid elevator. Now you do need to measure how far each one of these goes in. And the, the length will be a little bit different, maybe on each side, but it should be about the same. And like I said, I measured about 109 millimeters sticking out of here is where mine, I cut it off and it goes 190 millimeters into really into e each, uh, each elevator. You basically repeat this process for the other side. And uh, once you have your spar measured to the right side, you can reinstall both of them, and now you've got a really uh, sturdy elevator with a, with a really nice spar in here. The only downside to doing this is you have an extra spar running through here, but uh, you know, the, the strength of this thing and the, the way it flies, it's much more stable. Uh, it's, it's definitely uh, worth doing. And if you do a nice, neat job, you can see how nicely those two spars kind of sit in there. You've got one in there already, so uh, it's really not going to affect the airflow. Uh, really hardly at all, but it's real important, I think, just to have a really nice, uh, nice um, rigid stabilizer on the plane. Once again, guys, here's the uh, completed look at the stabilizer again with that, uh, that one extra spar there. This thing really is very rigid now, uh, and it's definitely the way uh, to, to, to fly this model. It just flies so much better, and it's a lot tougher. Uh, I'll go ahead and I'll actually submit this change over to Banana Hobby. Uh, and HSD for possibly even improving the plane. It's real easy to do guys. You don't have to do it. You can fly the plane as is. Uh, but if you really want to toughen up your tail, I found that this is the way to do it. It's real easy to put it in there. Uh, it's just really an awesome upgrade for this plane. One change I made to my airplane that really I think helps out a lot with uh, pitch control uh, is, uh, and increasing the resolution actually, is to actually uh, change the position of the uh, ball link on, uh, on the uh, elevator servos. Now you can do this on the ailerons as well. Um, what I found was is with full deflection, with full control deflection, which turned out to be uh, something like 30 millimeters up and down uh, on this thing, it was really just too much throw having, uh, having, uh, having this uh, ball link way out on almost the outermost hull. It was the next one in. Just gave me too much uh, elevator throw and the plane was real pitch sensitive. So. I had to dial it down about 70%, 60% in order to get the uh, correct amount of travel out of this because you really just don't need so much, uh, so much throw. Um, uh, but what that does is it kills the precision and the resolution of the servo. Um, you don't have that fine uh, movement that you need right around the, uh, the center point. So what I did was is I actually moved the ball link uh, down two holes. So um, I actually uh, moved it. It's on the, uh, from the outside, it's actually the fourth hole down. And what that did is that uh, increased the, or, or improved the uh, resolution of the servo and the fine control you have around the center uh, because you really don't need all that, uh, all that, uh, that uh, elevator movement uh, anyway. Now, I'm going to show you a closer look 
at the other one on the other wing just so you can kind of see what this looks like. You can see there that uh, it was on this uh, second outermost hole, but I moved it all the way in uh, two more holes, okay? And that actually, um, again, gave me really just about the right amount of throw uh, that I needed for the thing. Now, um, once you get the ball link uh, back on, um, you can also see that I actually had to carve away a little bit um, because the problem was is uh, there wasn't enough clearance for the ball link because the ball link now sort of recesses down in there. Um, but the end result of this thing is that uh, you now have really the right amount of, of movement, okay, in the elevator uh, without uh, losing resolution of the servos. Um, bottom line is these don't have to be all the way out here and, um, and uh, it's really a good idea just to move them in a little bit. You get much better control for your, uh, your uh, elevator around the, uh, around the middle section uh, where you need, especially for, for, uh, for higher speed flight. Anyway, guys, I think this is a really good improvement. It's made my model fly a whole lot better. Not a necessary change, but uh, I found that it definitely uh, improves the precision control uh, of uh, your flight control surfaces. It's important to note that when it does come to the rudder, though, uh, you do kind of want to go a little bit the opposite. Now, uh, I left it in the stock position. Notice on the horn on the actual rudder itself, they actually have it on the middle hole, whereas uh, all the others are on the outermost hole. Uh, and then they have, uh, have uh, uh, this hole here for the uh, bow link on the actual servo on almost the outer hole, and that's good because you want a lot of throw. Uh, the reason is, is you do want a lot of elevator uh, rudder travel, okay, on, your, on this airplane, um, if you want to do knife edge flying. And uh, when you do knife edge with this, uh, you need almost all the throw you can get, which is why they moved uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rudder ball actually to the middle one, so you actually get more rudder travel for doing good knife edges. All right, guys, that concludes this, uh, this build and setup guide on the uh, Air Epic HSD Super Viper from Banana Hobby. Uh, check this thing out at Banana Hobby. It's coming out real soon. As you can see from the video, um, real, real easy to build, real easy setup stuff. You just have to kind of know what it is. Most importantly, what I, what I want to inform everybody about, the tail changes that I made with the spar and the changes I made in the throws really made a tremendous difference. At how, how this airplane flies. It really stabilizes the pitch quite a bit and it's rock solid in pitch. It, it tended to drift just a little bit, I think because the elevator flexed a little bit uh, as it came stock and uh, you were losing some resolution on those tail servos. So with just a slight change to the tail that anybody can do real easy, it really turns this into a, a great flying airplane. Anyway guys, uh, once again, uh, the Air Epic HSD Super Viper from Banana Hobby. Check it out there. Thanks for checking out RC Informer and as always, we'll see you next time.